Amen. Amen. From John chapter 11, beginning at verse number 1, it reads this way. Now a man was sick, Lazarus from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was one who anointed the Lord with her perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. And it was her brother Lazarus who was sick. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, him, saying, Lord, the one you love is sick. When Jesus heard it, he said, this sickness will not end in death, but it is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after that, he said to the disciples, let's go to Judea again. Let's go to Judea again. This is the word of the Lord, and it is blessed. It is blessed. It is blessed. For our time together, I would like to title this sermon from this passage. I would like to title it, It is Time for Change. It is time for change. There's an old song that was penned that reads like this. I was born by the river in a little tent. And just like the river, I've been running ever since. It's been a long, a long time coming. But I know a change is going to come. Oh, yes, it will. A change is going to come. This song, its lyrics are penned by the famous and the great Sam Cooke. He penned these lyrics in the fall of 1963. For the young people who are not familiar with that song or perhaps you've never heard that song before, I, I want to let you know you're not going to find people dancing to it on TikTok, you have to Google it, but you would do yourself a favor to Google this song and listen to this song. When the song was released, it was in the spring of 1964, and it was right in the middle in the heat of the civil rights movement. And immediately, it became an anthem for the civil rights movement. Sam Cooke had found that special lyric that spoke to the hope and the belief of that generation. And as it did then, it has continued to provide each generation with the language and the sentiment all of us cling to as we feel in some way or another that a change is going to come. But as we stand at the threshold of this new year, looking towards 2022, I want to be real with you. And I want to ask you a question that I'm asking myself. How are you feeling about this new year that's coming? Do you feel a change is going to come? See, I know y'all by now, and I know that there are some of y'all who are watching that are super optimistic and you're super hopeful and you're expecting great things in 2022. But I know that there are a few of y'all that, if truth be told, you're not too optimistic about 2022. Matter of fact, Pastor Tanya, she was real with us this past Sunday, and she said that for her, she wasn't sure what she was looking for in 2022. And and that's how many of us feel. We, We don't have much that we have put ahead of us that we're looking forward to in 2022. We don't even know if change is even possible in 2022. Because I suspect for many of you listening and watching, you're like me, and that as we approach 2022, it feels very familiar. And it feels even eerily similar to what it felt like when we were going into 2021 last year. I'm sure there are some of you who are excited for the new year to strike midnight, to cross over to 2022, but I'm also sensitive to the fact that there are some people who, like me, it feels like we're just beginning again. It feels like one long groundhog day. There are people who had to spend yet another Christmas in quarantine by themselves in isolation. There are people who are grieving the loss of loved ones from 2021 and 2020. There are people who had to 
stand and wait in long lines trying to give a COVID test just these past few days. There are people who are concerned about the rise in COVID cases. Just this evening, I got a text message of a dear loved one who's in the hospital and has been in the hospital for a couple of weeks as a result of coming down and contracting COVID. And there are other people who are concerned about the rise in crime rates. It seems like tragedy is commonplace. And being up front with you, these last two years, in some way for me, they have felt like just one long, continuous year. And I know I'm not the only one that has felt this way, but I can't even sometimes remember which events occurred in 2020 and which events occurred in 2021. I have to go back through my phone and make sure that I'm remembering correctly. But I know I'm not the only one that feels this way because just this week, the Washington Post, they published an article with this headline. It said, the pandemic has caused nearly two years of collective trauma. And many people are at a breaking point. Isn't that the sentiment of many people? I even heard somewhere else that many of the major news stories from 2020 are really a continuation of the major news story. Excuse me, the major news stories of 2021 are a continuation of the major news stories of 2020. If you think about it, the verdicts that were given in 2021 for the cases of the trials of Cal Rittenhouse and the killing of Ahmaud Arbery, they were given in 2021, but those events actually took place in 2020. And so it seems like everything has just been continued over from 2020 into 2021. And we're not going to remember as years go on the distinction between these two years of 2020 and 2021. It's just felt like one big, long fog of two years. And it seems like collectively we haven't been able to shake the trauma of these past two years, the pain and the loss the weariness of these past two years. And many of us are having a hard time looking forward to the new year because there's stuff from 2021 that still hasn't been resolved in our life. There are things from these past two years that still feel unsettled. There are things from these past two years that have not been finished and feel like things have not been kept. Because if we're honest, there are a lot of things that haven't been resolved. There are a lot of loose ends that haven't been tied, and there are concerns that continue to linger and go unmet and unfinished. Sickness and disease, injustices and inequalities, crime in our urban cities continues to linger. And going into this new year, it feels like last year, there's just been this, this cloud of uncertainty as we go into this new year from last year, from 2021. But even in the midst of all of this uncertainty, even in the midst of all the difficult circumstances, in the midst of not knowing when all of this is going to be over, as one of my friends tweeted this week, our circumstances do not have to destroy us. In fact, one of the things that our passage, I believe, reminds us is that God can move even in the midst of uncertainty. God can change things while our circumstances feel like they are over and finished. Y'all, I know that there is much that feels unsettled and uncertain from 2021 as we go into 2022. But I believe that there are some prayers that God can still answer even though 2021 is coming to a close. There are some things that God can still do because even though the clock will strike, strike 12 in a few minutes tonight, that doesn't mean that God has ran out of time. That doesn't mean that God has ran out of time and he can't still answer that prayer, that he can't still fix that situation, that he can, still can't come through and help you out. God has never been confined to our finite linear time anyway, so why would he start now? And as we cross over into 2022, I want us to know that change is possible and that it is time for change. Listen, I can't guarantee that it will happen when the clock strikes midnight tonight. I can't guarantee that it will happen tomorrow or I can't even guarantee that it will happen this month. 
But I do know that change is possible and that it is time for change. See, I say change is possible because Jesus can show up at any time in your situation, no matter how unsettled, uncertain, frazzled it is. And he, when he changes, when he shows up in your situation, he can change that entire situation around. Matter of fact, that that's what this account teaches us. This is an account where it is shrouded with uncertainty. I want you to listen again to how this account starts. Just in the first five words, it says, now a man was sick. <laughs> how more sad can it get? They start off by telling us that there was a man sick. It's like sickness is all around because this word sick would be repeated five more times in this passage because it is so clear that this is an uncertain, unsettled situation and they're afraid that this sick man, Lazarus, is going to die. And so as a result, his sisters, Mary and Martha, they send word to Jesus and they send word to Jesus and they say, Jesus, the one you love, is sick. They don't even say, Jesus, would you come back? It is implied when they send that word, but they just want Jesus to know, Jesus, the one you love is sick. And it's so gloomy. It's so uncertain. And if you don't know how the story goes, spoiler alert, I will let you know that indeed when Jesus finally shows up in Bethany where Lazarus lived, it says in verse number 17 that when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Jesus had told them that this sickness would not end in death, but yet when Jesus gets to Bethany, Lazarus has been dead for four days. I mean, how more uncertain can you get? But another spoiler alert, that's not how the story ends because down in verse number 43, it tells us that Jesus goes to, goes to the tomb where Lazarus had been laid and he tells them to take back the stone and he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And hear this, a dead man came out, bound hand and foot with linen strips and with his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unwrap him and let him go. See, when Jesus shows up on the scene, anything can happen. And Jesus can change any situation. See, although this situation starts with sickness, it ends with a resurrection. <laughs> And that's what Jesus can bring to any circumstance that is clouded with uncertainty. Jesus, when he shows up, he can start one way. But once, even though it starts one way, clouded with uncertainty, clouded with sickness, he can end it up so that it results in resurrection. What starts off one way, it can change. And can it end up even giving God glory through the change? But you know what? As usual, we like to skip straight to the end, don't we? We like to go to the part where Jesus resurrects Lazarus from the dead without feeling the tension in the middle of the story. And that's where I want us to spend some time tonight because I know that for many people, you're in the tension of being in the middle of the story. You're waiting for midnight, but you're not even really waiting for midnight because you feel like it's just going to be the same as it was yesterday. But I want you to know that even in your midnight hour, God can turn your situation around. This change that Jesus brought about, it included God getting the glory. What if God wants to make a change in your life that it may leave you unsettled and uncomfortable for a few days and for a few moments and for a little while, but ultimately it brings about his glory in your life. What if on the other side of your change is God's glory? Would you be willing to go through some discomfort for a little while? Would you be willing to say, for your glory, I will do anything if you knew that in the moments, the midnight hour moments, it was going to be a little bit uncomfortable. 
What if your change is to bring about God's glory? See, Jesus was about to change this situation all around such that it would give glory to God, though. And I believe that God is going to change someone's situation. But not only will he change your situation, but he's going to bring his glory through that situation as well. I believe that God can use your change for his glory. I believe that God can work in your situation and change your situation around and that he'll work in it in order to bring about ultimately not just your change, but his glory. Somebody should put that in the chat. My change for his glory. 2022, it is my change for God's glory. See, not only will he change you, but he'll get glory out of the situation too. And here's the thing. I, I don't... I, I don't want to, uh, I'm tempted to come and give this prophetic message where um, I can say with certainty that I know it's going to happen at a certain time or at a certain hour or at a certain week in a certain month. But I, I can't guarantee you when it will happen. I can't guarantee you that it will happen when the clock strikes 12 tonight. I can't guarantee you that it will happen tomorrow or the next week or the next month. But I can guarantee that God's going to get the glory out of your situation. And I can guarantee that God's going to change your situation. Jesus, he is in the business of changing situations. Even before we get to what happens with Lazarus in these introductory verses, it says that, it's, it tells us, um, giving context, it says, now man was sick, Lazarus, he was from Bethany, and it tells us that this place, Bethany, was the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And then to help us understand where this was, listen to how John describes where this area, he describes this area by telling us about Lazarus' sister Mary. He says, Mary was the one who anointed with the Lord, anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. And it was her brother Lazarus who was sick. This is, seems like an odd way for John to introduce what's about to happen because no, John has not mentioned yet that Mary would actually anoint Jesus' feet and wipe it with her hair. He doesn't mention that until the next chapter, chapter 12. But here's what happens is, is that because Jesus was so known for changing people's situation, John knew that he could let them know who this guy Lazarus was by talking about who Mary was and what Jesus had done in Mary's life such that she poured out her life. She poured out everything on Jesus' feet in order to worship Jesus. And right here in this introduction, we see a woman who had been changed by Jesus. She had been changed by Jesus so that she was known for her worship. As we go into 2022, I just want to ask you, what are you known for? See, Mary's worship preceded her. It was her story. And everybody knew about Mary even before John recorded Mary's story of when she anointed Jesus' feet with her hair and her oil. What do people know about you? What do people think about you when they see you walking towards them? Do they think about you like they thought about Martha? Martha, Mary's sister, y'all, she was, she was super spiritual. Matter of fact, when Jesus is on his way to, to raise Lazarus from the dead, uh, Martha meets Jesus on the way, and, and she says to Jesus, Jesus, had you been here, he wouldn't have had to die. And Jesus says to her, listen, listen, it's, it's okay because I am the way, I am the truth, I am the resurrection, I am the one that can bring, you, bring him life, back to life again. She says, yeah, I know all that. I know that at the end time that he'll resurrect from the dead. She was super spiritual but was she known for her worship? See, some people, your super spirituality is a turnoff, but Mary's worship is one that preceded her in a way that everybody knew that she was a worshiper. Matter of fact, we don't even know much about Lazarus because Lazarus doesn't say a whole lot. There's no words recorded about Lazarus, and so we don't even know much about Lazarus, but people knew about Mary because of her worship. Listen, do, 
do people know about you because of your worship? Or do they know about you because you, you, you can brag on the theology that you know? Because you can brag on what you have done? Because you can brag on the fact that you've been at church for 50 years and you've never backslidden? We need to be people who are sitting at the feet of Jesus and willing to pour out everything for him because Jesus changes situations. But before Jesus changes Lazarus' situation, John gives us three significant things in this passage that we need to notice that helps us know that things are about to change. Look again with me at verse number four. It says, when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he said, this sickness will not end in death, but it is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And he gives us that and letting us know that Jesus is about to do something spectacular. But then listen to what he says after that. He says, now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. See, the reason why we could know that something was about to change it's because it says, notice what it says here in verse number five. Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. Did you notice there that Jesus loves them? And because he loved them, he loved them so much that their situation would not stay the same. See, that's what we need to be encouraged about today is that God loves us so much that he will never allow our situations to stay the way they were. He will never allow our circumstances not to change because he loves us. See, John is very clear that Jesus loved Martha. He loved her sister Mary, and he loved Lazarus. And because he loved them, he was going to do something about their situation. I just want to let somebody know who's listening tonight. You need to know that Jesus loves you too much to let you stay where you are. Jesus loves you too much to allow you to stay in those circumstances without changing it. Jesus loves you too much for it not to change. See, we learned it when we were children. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Yes, Jesus loves me. See, Jesus loved them too much for their situation to stay the same. And his love was so profound. Do you know that you are more loved than you could ever imagine by Jesus? You are more loved than you could ever imagine. Jesus gave his life to demonstrate his love to you. He hung, bled, and died on a cross to tell you how much he loves you. And if he would do that for you, why would he not change your situation? I know you think your situation is final and that there's no way for him to change it and get any glory out of it, but God loves you so much that he will not allow your situation to stay the same. Jesus' love sometimes, though, and includes trouble. See, Jesus' love for us is difficult when it includes trouble. But do you know that Jesus' love for us does not always come without some moments of trouble, some moments of tension, some moments of uncertainty. But Jesus' love for us is not predicated on whether or not he withholds trouble in our life. And perhaps that's why some of us get a little bit off. Because we tend to judge Jesus' love through the lens of our circumstances. As opposed to judging our circumstances through the lens of Jesus' love. See, many of us, we judge Jesus' love for us through our circumstances. And that has the problem with that is that we then begin to think that his love is circumstantial. No! 
It doesn't matter what the situation is, what the circumstance is. I know that Jesus can bring, can allow trouble to happen, and he still loved me. Because sometimes I don't know his purposes. Sometimes I don't know his plans. But I do know this, that he loves me. And that if he loves me, he's going to bring me through it, and he's going to bring me through it changed, and he's going to get the glory about it. You don't believe me? Just ask Job. Job was sitting just minding his business, doing everything that the Lord had told him. And then suddenly out of nowhere, stuff starts being stripped away from him. But little did Job knew that he was being worked on by a plan behind the scenes. And God allowed the enemy some room in Job's life because Job loved God, because Job was faithful, because Job was a righteous man. And here it is, is that God restored everything back to Job in the end. And Job now can sit from heaven and say, listen, I didn't understand when I was going through it. I thought that God had stopped loving me, but God had not stopped loving him, even through the midst of the trouble, even through the midst of the uncertainty, even in the midst of everything being stripped away. God still loved him. See, we got to be careful that we don't look at Jesus' love through the lens of our circumstance. We have to look at our circumstances through the lens of Jesus' love. If we meet or met with a circumstance that doesn't feel good, that is a little bit uncomfortable, where there is some uncertainty, we need to say, I know Jesus loves me. And if I know Jesus loves me and he still allowed this to happen, he allowed it to happen for a reason. I know that he loved me. And so even though this circumstance is daunting, even though this circumstance is difficult, even though this circumstance feels final, I know that he loved me. And I know that he's not going to leave me here because he loved me too much to leave me right here. See, if you don't believe me, not only can we ask Job, but you can ask Jesus. Ask Jesus himself. Remember what Jesus says on the cross? Father, Why have you forsaken me? It seemed like God's love had left Jesus at that moment. But no, God was still loving Jesus as he loved us in order that Jesus would die to pay the penalty for our sins. And now that we through him would have life. And that's why Jesus was obedient to death, even on the cross, that at the proper time, God would exalt him and give him the name that is above every name. See, we can't judge Jesus' love through the lens of our circumstances. We must judge our circumstances through the lens of Jesus' love because he loves us. Somebody listening needs to know that he loves even you. Listen to the passage. It says that Jesus loved Martha and her bossy self, her busy self, her running her mouth self. He loved her sister Mary, who it seems maybe had a questionable lifestyle, but he loved her too. And he loved little old quiet Lazarus as well. It's like John lets us know that God's love runs the gamut of everybody. The ones who are self-righteous, and they're so self-righteous that they can't even see their own unrighteousness. But he also loves the one who realizes how unrighteous they are and that they fall at the feet of Jesus to say, thank you for saving me. They love the ones who don't even have the words sometimes to express praise to God. God loves all of his little children. And I want to let somebody know, you cannot do anything that you can outrun Jesus' love. Jesus loves you more than you could imagine. His love for you is so profound that he died for you. And so we know, we know that Jesus was going to change this situation around. Because Jesus loved them. See, love doesn't always look like what we expect it to. 
but we need to be rest assured that even when love doesn't look like what we expect it to, that Jesus still loves us and that he can still get good purposes out of even our difficulties and even our trouble. Our dear brother, minister, Jeremiah Hicks said it earlier when he quoted Romans 8, 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. See, it is because we know that Jesus loves us that he, we can be sure that he's going to change the situation around. That's why verse 35 says, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, or any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God. The love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jesus loves you too much for your situation to stay the way it is. Jesus loves you too much for your circumstances not to change. And sometimes his love doesn't look like we expect it to. Because notice what happens next in this passage. It says that Jesus loved them. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. That seems like a contradiction. It seems like when Jesus would have learned that Lazarus was sick, he would have rushed immediately to go heal Lazarus because Jesus has healing power. He had demonstrated over and over again that he had healing power. Matter of fact, this is the seventh miracle that John records, and many of the other miracles had to do with his healing power. But Jesus loved them, so he stayed. That sounds like a contradiction, but I want to let you know what's happening here is that it's not even saying that Jesus loved them, and even though he loved them, that he stayed. He stayed because he loved them. What sense does that make? Because, see, Jesus' love, it is oftentimes unexpected. Jesus, here's what is happening, is that Jesus had a plan that was not their plan. You know, that's when we get messed up, don't we? It's when Jesus has a different plan than what we have. But Jesus had a plan, and Jesus knew what the plan was, and Jesus knew what the outcome should be. And so even though it felt uncomfortable for him not to come right away, and even though his delay would make it so that Lazarus would die, he still stayed because Jesus knew what was on the other end. See, that's why you got to go back up to verse number four. It says, Jesus said to them, this sickness will not end in death. See, that's why I read from the CSB, because the Christian Standard Bible, it gets it right in this translation. It says that it will not end in death. Here it is, is that it will not end ultimately in death. Yes, death may happen for a few days, but Jesus has power over death, hell, and the grave. And even though it may not make sense why Jesus stayed two days longer, Jesus had a plan. And his plans are not our plans. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. In moments like this, we have to trust Jesus' plan. See, we know he loves us. And if he allowed it to happen, we're looking at the circumstances. We're looking at his plan when he did not change it when we wanted to. We're saying, I don't understand it, but I know you got a plan. I don't understand why you're causing this delay because I think if you came right now, we'll fix it and things will be changed around. But Jesus says, I got a different plan. See, my plan is not just to make you comfortable, but to bring me glory when I change this situation around. Will you be willing to allow your change to bring God's glory? See, that's what happens in here. His response to the fact that he loved them was to wait two more days. Do you know that God's plan oftentimes 
may involve a delay. What do, you, what do you do in those moments when there's a delay? When it seems like God is not working as fast as we would like him to work. Those are some tough moments. Those midnight moments when things feel uncertain and unfinished. Where some things feel final when we wish they had gone another way. Remember that all of Jesus' delays are not final. Remember that Jesus' timing is impeccable. See, Jesus doesn't just come at the nick of time. Jesus comes right on time. And, and I know that might seem like just a little pat answer for you, but it is so true, and it's something that we need to hold on to if we're going to believe that change is coming because the truth of the matter is is that God is never late to his appointments. God is never late to his destination. And God is never late getting you to where he needs you to be right on time. Perhaps you've heard the illustration told before about in football, there is something called a timing play. In this season that we've been having, there's been so much COVID outbreak that, that there have been replacement quarterbacks and they haven't been able to execute these time and plays because what has to happen is <clears throat> there has to be a rhythm between the quarterback and the wide receiver. I was listening the other day, and they were saying that this quarterback, he wasn't able to throw the ball as quickly as he should have to get to the receiver because he hadn't had enough time in practice with this receiver to be able to read his body language to know when he was about to turn. And what happens as a timing play is you don't run um, necessarily a specific route. The, excuse me, the, 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 the quarterback does not pass to a specific route. The quarterback passes to a specific place. He's not waiting for the receiver to be open. He's just going to throw it to where he knows the receiver will be at a certain time. And so what happens is, is that you throw the ball before the wide receiver even sees the ball coming. Because the wide receiver might not be open yet. It might seem like he's still covered. But the, the quarterback has to trust the timing of the play and that the receiver will get to where he's supposed to be at the right time. And that's what God's system is like. God says, listen, if you'll just run the route, if you'll just turn the corner when you're supposed to, I'm going to make sure that I get the ball to you right on time. Because God is never late to his appointments. He's never late arriving to his destinations. I know you might have to wait on the train sometimes. You might have to wait on the plane sometimes. You might have to wait on the automobile sometimes in traffic. But guess what? None of that gets in God's way. There's never weather that intrudes what God's plan is trying to do. There's never traffic that gets in the way. There's never a derailment because God always gets to his destination right on time. But as you're waiting, I want to remind you what Isaiah chapter 40 tells us. It says, do you not know? Have you not heard? That the Lord is an everlasting God. He is the creator of the whole earth. He never becomes faint or weary. There is no limit to his understanding. He gives strength to the faint and strengthens the powerless. And even though youths may become faint and weary and young men stumble and fall, those who wait on the Lord... They will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not become weary. They will walk and not faint. I know it may feel like a delay. I know things may feel like they're final. I know things might feel uncertain and unfinished. But just wait on the Lord. Know that he's going to come. The old folks said it, and we say it as, a, as, as just repeating something out of habit. But it is so true. He may not come when you want him to come. But our God is always right 
on time. Wait on the Lord, I say. Wait on the Lord. Be strengthened while you wait. Because know that as you wait, God is strengthening you. He's increasing your stamina. He's increasing your endurance. He's increasing your perseverance so that you learn how to wait for him and wait for him some more. Just know that he's going to show up. Know that he's going to come right on time. And indeed, that's how this portion of the text ends. It lets us know that Jesus, after those two days, after that delay, in verse number seven, it says that after that, he said to his disciples, come on, let's go. It's time for a change to happen. Come on, let, let's go to Judea. It's time for a change to happen. I, I don't know about you, but when I hear Jesus say, let's go, I, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready to go wherever, wherever Jesus says, let's go. Because when Jesus mounts up his, his forces, when Jesus gets all of his angels together, when he brings his power to a situation, everything must change when Jesus shows up. And we know that this situation is about to change because, first of all, Jesus loved them. Second of all, Jesus had a plan. But third of all, because Jesus started on his way. And I want somebody to know that you can know that Jesus is on the way. And because Jesus is on the way, change is on the way. And because Jesus is on the way, help is on the way. Because Jesus is on the way, your situation is about to turn around. Your situation is about to change. Circumstances may feel unfinished, unsettled right now, but Jesus is on the way. Oh, yes, he's coming. He's coming. He's riding on like a cloud, and he's coming your way. He's sending his power your way. I love the fact that even though there had been a, de been a delay, he started on his way to Lazarus' direction. I don't know if there's anybody listening who is grateful that Jesus headed in your direction. Yes, you're waiting for him to head your direction again, but there was one day that he headed your direction and he changed your situation around. And I'm so glad for the change. Changed I am because Jesus headed my way. If you don't believe that Jesus can start changing stuff even when he's on his way, just ask the woman with the issue of blood. I don't know if you know, but Jesus was on his way to heal Jairus' daughter. But on the way, there was this woman who had an issue with blood. She had, had an issue with blood for a long, just bleeding out just for a long time. But it was on the way that she said, if I can just get to Jesus and just touch the hem of his garment, I know that I will be changed. And see, I want to help somebody else to know that, yes, Jesus can change when he gets there, but Jesus can start changing stuff even while he's on the way. Even while he's on the way, you can start feeling renewed. You can start feeling refreshed. You can start having your hope up because you know that a change is going to come because Jesus is headed your way. See, I don't know if you know, but I I've seen it happen sometimes where, uh, somebody would get in a situation, and, and they start running their mouth. They start running their mouth, and they, and, and they get themselves into a situation where their mouth, um, they, uh, they, they could not back up what their words were saying. Y'all ever seen that situation? Somebody just running their mouth, saying stuff, and, and then they, they get themselves into a corner, and all that stuff that they said, they couldn't back none of it up. They had a whole lot of bark, but no bite. But I, I saw one situation where... That happened, and, and somebody called, called their family members. They said, listen, I, I done backed myself in a corner, but, but I, I need some help. And, and the family members said, where? We on the way. They drove all night long to get there, and when their help got there, the situation changed around. And that's the good news about Jesus is that when he sees you in a trouble, when he sees you in a fix, when he sees you pinned in a corner, guess what? He says, let's go. My son needs some help. Let's go. My daughter needs some help. Let's go. Help is on the way. Change is on the way. There will be a change that's coming when Jesus arrives on the scene because when he 
arrives and he shows up, everything must change. Everything must turn around. I don't know how. I may not know when, but I do know that help is on the way because Jesus is on the way. He's headed your direction. He has your address in mind. Matter of fact, you think that he lost your address. You think that he forgot where you were. He, you think that he forgot what your address was. But no, Jesus is coming to your door. Jesus is coming to your house. He knows your address. He knows your zip code. He knows where you live. And he knows exactly where to find you. He hasn't forgotten. It's just been a delay. And in this delay, I hope you've been waiting on the Lord. I hope you've been renewing your strength because he's going to change it. And not only is he going to change it, but he's going to get the glory out of it. I don't know how he's going to get the glory, but I can guarantee you that he's going to get the glory out of it. Because when Jesus changes a situation, he always gets the glory. He always brings glory to the Father when he changes the situation. That's what he did when he got up out of the grave on the third day. People thought that there had been a delay that was final. But on the third day, Jesus got up with all power in his hands, and he changed the situation. He changed it for me, and he changed it for you. And if he's done it before, I can guarantee you that he's going to do it again. I want you to hear Jesus saying to, saying to his boys, let's go. Lazarus is in need of help. Let's go. My daughter is in need of help. Let's go. My son is in need of help. Help is on the way. Change is going to come. I know it's going to come because Jesus loves you too much for that situation to stay the way it is. I know it's going to come because Jesus always has a plan. It may not be our plan, but he always has a plan. Even if it includes a delay, he's got a plan, and he's going to fix it. He's going to turn it around, and it's going to work out just in time. Because he's heard your cry. He's heard your plea. He's heard you saying, Jesus, the one you love is sick. He's heard you. He's heard you saying, Jesus, I know you love me. But I don't understand why I had to go this way. He's heard you, and he's sending help your way. A change is going to come. I don't know when. I don't know how. But I know a change is going to come. And I know that when this change comes, it's going to bring about his glory. And we want him to get all of the glory. We give you all the glory, oh God. In this new year. That's what we want. We want you to get the glory. Even if it requires for something to change in us, for you to get the glory. For your glory, oh God, we will do anything. Father God, thank you so much for the time in your word. Thank you for encouraging us in your word. Thank you for speaking to us in your word letting us know and reminding us that you love us too much for our situations to stay the way they, they are. Thank you so much in your word that you let us know that every delay is not final and that you can even turn dead situations around, that what started in sickness can be raised to life again. And God, I thank you that we are reminded that you're on the way. <laughs> that you're going to see to it, that you're going to bring the full force of your weight, the full force of your power onto our situation. And it's going to change. It's going to change, and it's going to bring you glory. God, we don't know when, we don't know how, but we are expecting for a change to come that will bring you glory. In Jesus' name, amen.